This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. Back at the lab, back at it, another episode of Superior Sports Talk presented by Locked On Sports Minnesota. Long time no see. What's happening, Reggie? What's happening? Back at it with my guy, Luke underscore Spinman. Back at it. Woo. Let's go. Feels good to be back in the booth. We got a big show lined up today. We got Nash Walker coming in from Locked On Twins, coming in to talk about their series win in Toronto. Plus later, I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean. It's all coming up on Superior Sports Talk. But first, save time and money when using Rock Auto. Rock Auto is a family served business serving do-it-yourselfers like Reggie and I for over 20 years. Reliably low prices for every customer. Reggie, they're practically giving this stuff away from brake parts to tail lamps, even new carpet for your vehicle. Go to rockauto.com today and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their how did you hear about us section so they know we sent you. That's Rock Auto. Dot com. All right. Well, CBS Sports' Jordan Dejani wrote over the weekend his NFC North over-under win total predictions. And I want to take a moment, get your thoughts on some of these. Let's start in Chicago. The Bears, over-under right now set at six and a half games. They went six and 11 last year. Vegas thinks they won't improve much, if at all. Dejani said he's taken the under and mentions, just as we both have said here plenty of times, they struggled to add any playmakers for the development of Justin Fields. You know I agree with him, even saying the Bears will be picking in the top five next year. That's my hot take. But over Mm -hmm. or under six and a half games for the Bears in 2022, Reggie? I I think that's about right. I put that that there. You know, I I think they'll be energized. They'll have, you know, I, I think they'll play hard. You know, Matt Eberflus coming over from Indy. I think he's going to be a, a good head coach in the league. And so I think they'll play hard for him. But what he has to do is figure out the whole Justin Fields situation. They drafted him to be the franchise guy. And so far in your tenure, you know, at the very start, him and the new GM, like you didn't do enough to put a to put the supporting cast around Justin Fields to make a lot of us feel comfortable about what they're doing on offense. And you're just like, well, you know, maybe they're they're going to try to, you know, pound it in the running game, have a strong running game. That's fine. But, you know, I'm not necessarily all that scared about that either when you're talking about playing the Bears. The only thing that really kind of scares me about it is, you know, Justin Fields is a playmaker. And he'll be able to extend plays. He'll make, uh, you know, some cool things happen with his legs. And he'll... He'll, you know, make the wild throws. The, the dude has an absolute cannon. We've seen it. And he's a gamer as well. And so he'll he'll help them win some games this year. But there's only so much that he can do with a limited, you know, amount of skill position talent around him. He loses Allen Robinson and they really don't replace him with much. You know, you talk about, you know, St. Brown, Byron Pringle. Tajay Sharp, I mean, that's a name that, you know, maybe three, four years ago, you're like, okay, Tajay Sharp. But, like, now it's just like, well, really haven't seen or heard a whole bunch about him in recent years to make you really kind of scared of what he can do. You know he has talent. And then they're relying on guys like Mooney, who is probably going to be wide receiver one. I saw just a video this morning of him this morning mossing some kids at a camp. (laughs) But then, (laughs) then you're talking about, the rookie Jones who, you know, they're thinking might be a breakout guy. And it's just like there's too many ifs and too many variables. Right. Like you want to think Jones is going to be a good um, a good pick for them and, and, and a solid rookie receiver because, you know, these rookies are just kind of rookieing out of control lately. You know, with Justin Jefferson a couple years ago, Jamar Chase last year, maybe you think a guy like Jones could come through and, and be a guy. But, you know, when you're relying on him – Mooney, St. Brown, Pringle, you're just like, eh, 
I, I'm not really sure. Let's not forget Jamar Chase, top five pick, Bolitnikoff Award winner. Right. Stud right away for a reason, right? We knew the talent. Right. Justin Jefferson, first round pick for a reason. Right. Felix Jones, I really like the guy. I really do. But but to put all of this uh, expectations and all your eggs in these baskets of Mooney, Velas Jones, you know, when you look at the over-unders of these, you really got to look at the schedule up and down. And they start against the Niners and the Packers. But then there's a handful of winnable games, Texans, Giants, Washington, New England, mm-hmm. We'll see how they do. But um, it's going to be tough, man. You mentioned losing Allen Robinson. You lose Akeem Hicks. You lose Khalil Mack. And who do you bring in again to be the big prize free agent pickup? The new weapon for your young quarterback, Byron Pringle? Come on. Yeah. Neilis Jones, baby. I don't like it. All right. Next Time one. Shine. Detroit Lions. Vegas thinks they'll actually be worse than the Bears. Lions over under set at just six games. I really like Dan Campbell and what that front office is doing over there, but they did only win three games last season. How do you think the Lions end up with another year under Campbell and another good offseason with Aiden Hutchinson and Jamison Williams? You know, I'm I'm fairly optimistic about what the Lions are gonna do. You know, they got six. I think the crazy thing is is Jared Goff, you know. Mm-hmm. Um you know, Sean McVay was able to get a lot out of Jared Goff, and that helped. But it's just like I think he's just the guy. You know, I feel like I feel like he's kind of like a poor man's Kirk Cousins, and that's that's saying a lot because you know Kirk Cousins is is a solid quarterback, but I don't think you know anybody's expecting him to just light it on fire. And when you say that Jared Goff is like a poor man's Kirk Cousins, you're just not really. He doesn't throw a, a deep ball as well as Kirk Cousins, mm-hmm. and and he's not as consistent as Kirk Cousins. But he's a he's a good, moderately good quarterback. You know, he he had enough to beat the Vikings last year. You know, he made some just dazzling throws against them in that game that they won in the D last year. But like. Other than that, it's just like, you know, they put all these skill position guys around him. They put all this talent, you know, talk about Hutchinson. And, you know, now he's throwing to guys like Jamison Williams sometime later this fall. And you're just like, hmm, they got some pieces. Like, they they might be able to compete a little bit. But I think keeping them at that six win total just because of the quarterback is probably right. No, you're right. I mean, no easy gimmies in the NFL. Any given Sunday, and and this is not a team you want to fall asleep on during the week. Oh, no. I think they're going to have a few shock factor games and wins during the season and flash some serious growth, but ultimately, you're right, it always comes back down to quarterback play, and Jared Goff just seems to be kind of trending in the wrong direction. Jamison <laughs> Williams won't even be there to help him for the first Five, six, seven, eight games, too. So um, I'm taking the under here, too. All right, Green Bay Packers have won 13 games or more in back-to-back-to-back seasons. And now, despite losing Devontae Adams, their over-under actually went up from 10.5 last year to 11 this year. I know they added some great defensive pieces and look primed to have a new defense identity that can carry the load for Rodgers, take some pressure off the old man here. But could this be the year a little step back and regression finally takes place over or under 11 games for the Packers? Mm, I don't think it'll be necessarily a regression. Mm -hmm. I I think 11 is probably fair. Mm -hmm. I I like a lot of these uh, these ones here with with these over under projections. I think they're like right on line with maybe what I think. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers, so he's going to keep them in as many games as possible. But, you know, he doesn't necessarily have the same guys that he's been used to throwing to. And it's going to take some time. I saw some reports this morning that he did report to Lambeau Field for mandatory minicamp today. So that's promising. They're going to need that time. They're going to need that work to to really kind of like get them together. But at the same time, it's just like you, you don't lose a guy like Devontae Adams and the offense gets better. And it's great that you're, you know, doing the thing with the defense and all that. But what we've seen with the NFL is these offenses are just uber dynamic. And I know that that playoff game between the Packers and the 49ers uh, earlier this year was kind of like a throwback 
in a way because it wasn't very high scoring. Defense and special teams made the difference. And it's like, you know, in the playoffs, those type of things happen. And so they their their mind is there as far as like getting to the playoffs and being in position to be able to, you know, duke it out with a team like the Niners again if that were to happen. Uh, they they don't feel like they would suffer the same fate with some of the moves that they've made. But look, man, the offense, the offense is always is, uh, you know, it's always going to be what what sells games and what and what brings people to to these games. And I think they lost a little bit on that. And, you know, if they're trying to play teams to a 12, 6, 12, 10 game, you know, great, you know, whatever. But I just don't see that happening. So. I put that, you know, I want to say maybe 12, maybe, but I think the 11 is right there. Yeah, again, I go back. You got to kind of cherry pick and look at this schedule, and you start with the division, and I'm sitting here thinking, well, they got Chicago and Detroit for four games alone, two teams Mm -hmm. we just kind of ripped apart. That's 4-0 and right there alone before I even start to dive into the rest of the schedule. They split with Minnesota every year, uh, and that's why they win 13 games every season. They go 5-1 and one practically every year in the division and end up with that one or two seed in the NFC heading into the playoffs. As much as it hurts, I'll take the over as well. And I, I, I hope at worst, I think, if you're a betting man, that you get a push with 11 wins because it seems like kind of their floor right now for the Green Bay Packers. All right, drum roll, please. Minnesota Vikings, they were 8-9 and nine last year. Despite losing a ton of close games down to the wire, brand new coaching staff, brand new regime on the books. Their over-under win total this year in 2022, Reggie, is nine. And even nine, flat solid, no nine and a half, eight and a half, nine games. Reggie DeJohnny is taking the over for the Vikings at nine and notes he doesn't think They'll necessarily light the world on fire, but feels very comfortable betting on them to be a double-digit win team this year. Your thoughts? Yeah, I would agree with that. I like this dude. I may have to start following like him on guy. Twitter. I, mean, I, I like- mean, he's he's, he's, he's <laughs> solid. He's solid. You know, I do think that the schedule is tough. I'm taking a look at it. You know, you start with Green Bay, go to Philly, Detroit, New Orleans, and London. Uh, then, then you're talking about the Bears, the Dolphins, Cardinals, Commanders, Bills, Cowboys, Patriots, Jets. Like, yeah, it's gonna be pretty tough. Yeah, it's no gimmies. Pretty tough. Yeah, yeah. Indy. Uh, the Giants should be improved. Then you got the Packers and Bears to end the season. Like, yeah, this, this, this is gonna be tough. But you know what, though, I think they built the team to be able to compete with each and every team that they're playing this year. And that's exciting because you're just like, you know, they're going to have a chance to win all of these games that they play. Like, I don't I don't see a game on this schedule that I'm just like, oh, dang, man. That's, well, thanks for coming, Minnesota, because that's an L, you know, like they almost beat the Cardinals last year. They did beat the, the Packers one out of two times last year. Like the bills okay maybe the bills game you're just like dang that i don't know about that one right there but you know like out of all the games you're just like man like you look at the weapons on the other side of the field and you're just like i put the vikings weapons up against just about anybody in the league they can hang and so you know I, i would i would not be surprised if they did sneak over that that double digit win total this season because you look at the team last year, they weren't terrible. There were so many games that went down to the final possession that could have gone either way, and, and they could have easily found themselves in the double-digit win category. So they think that they've improved the team to be able to be better in those close games like that. So if that's the difference, I could see them going double digits and wins. Yeah, good point. I mean, they were in nearly every game last season down to the wire. Most of those went the other way, but they got a lot of buzz nationally from a lot of national experts, NFL experts around the country, and rightfully so. I mean, a pretty talented roster up and down that I think a lot of people agree just needed a fresh coaching change, hit the reset button. They not only get one, but they bring in a guy that brings in a new system that fits the landscape of this new pass-happy league, and they got the right pieces and weapons in place to kind of hit the ground running, I think. Not have a long transition period here where it takes four, five, six weeks to kind of sputter out the gate. Yeah. Uh, 
and an underperforming defense that now healthy should mm-hmm. make a lot of noise and bounce back in a big way too. I think this team's young and hungry. Get back on track here this season. This is a two-team division, no doubt. And the Vikings, I think you said it last week, are going to be nipping at the heels yeah. of the Packers all season long for that top spot. Going to be a lot of fun. These, of course, just a crapshoot. It's early, June 6th today, but you know, it's fun to go up and down the division and see what experts in Vegas is saying about the NFC North. Yeah. All right, coming up, our guy Nash Walker coming in to talk twins from Locked On Minnesota Twins. And later, I'm putting Reggie through the gauntlet with what does it mean. But first, our partners at Bet Online continue to be your number one source for all your betting needs. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports info, including this year's basketball finals, MLB fights, and even NFL futures. You want to throw a little money down on that NFC North? Have at it with Bet Online. Head to the website today. Or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and actions. Bet online where the game starts. All right, well, let's talk about those twins, shall we? And to help us do so, let's bring in our very own Lockdown Twins and MLB expert, Nash Walker, on Twitter, at NashWalker9. And Nash, absolutely pleasure to have you on today, and not Friday as originally planned, because we love talking some twins after they win a couple, (laughs) and the mood was not so great after last week, struggling against that soft spot in the schedule and we knew things would only get tougher heading into Toronto this weekend without so many big key names but they win two of three come away with the series how about just some quick thoughts and takeaways from this weekend's series over the Blue Jays to kick us off well thank you guys so much for having me this is my third season as a host of Locked On Twins, so I've seen a little bit from the Twins, of course, in the last couple of years. Fourth season writing at Twins Daily, started in 2019 over there. So I was doing five days a week last year for the last place Twins, recording every single day after their games. <laughs> and the biggest difference to me from I'm, – I'm grateful now, guys. I'm grateful now that I had that because I can I compare – and I learned a lot, and I, I was focused on the prospects. I know the farm system so much better than I did you know, a year and a half ago. So watching that team every single day, the biggest difference for me is their depth just crumbled last year. Mm. And you watch this series this weekend. It's Nick Gordon. It's Alberto Celestino. It's Devin Smeltzer. It's Jose Miranda. It's the depth that comes up. And Jermaine Palacios had a big hit and played a great shortstop this weekend for the most part, had a blunder on Saturday. Saturday we'll forget about, but Friday and Sunday Palacios was great. That's the difference for me. In 2021, I thought this team was very deep, and they were projected to, if not win the American League Central, be a co-favorite in the American League Central, coming off two division titles, rightly so. I thought they were deep in the rotation, in the bullpen, and especially on the position player side. It crumbled on them in 2021, and the difference so far, I mean, they haven't gotten a whole lot out of Carlos Correa. Byron Buxton's missed time. He wasn't good in May. So the top half of the roster, even Jorge Polanco hasn't done it like he did in 2021. So the difference, the reason to me why they're eight games above 500 is they they pitch very well overall. The depth in the rotation, the depth in the bullpen, and the depth on the position player side with guys like Celestino, Gordon, they're they're producing and they're coming through and in spots where the twins need them. And Miranda recently has done so after looking like he didn't belong in the majors. <laughs> now he's starting to hit some homers and play better defense. So that's that's been the difference. That was the storyline for me this weekend with the matchups. I think the twins were plus two hundred in all three of these games. Huge mm-hmm. underdogs in these games. You look at the matchups with Chichi Gonzalez, with Devin Smeltzer going against Kevin Gaussman. They just jumped on Gaussman yesterday, and that's what they needed to do. The offense also just kind of took control of two games, and and they needed that early on in these games. Yeah, they they didn't take care of business against the – the former uh, twin Berrios, but you know, it's fine. Whatever. It happens. It happens real quick. Before I ask you this question, Nash, uh, real quick, you might recognize this M I Z (laughs) Z O U. Right. Yes. Oh, yes. Go. All right. All right. Quick aside. That was a quick aside, but getting back to the twins, you mentioned that pitching. Do you feel like that's the biggest surprise? Cause I feel like that was the biggest, like, question mark coming into this season yeah definitely I mean it has to be at this point I think when you looked at last year's team as well again and you saw the rotation before the season with Maeda Barrios Pineda Jay Happ and Matt Shoemaker I felt okay about it and it still felt like they would they'll need 
reinforcements. They will need reinforcements. This is not a team you want to go into the postseason with. They're a long ways away from getting there. But, yes, that has been a surprise. Joe Ryan, has he been a surprise? I mean, I think we saw last year what he could do. I'm surprised that he's continued it into this year at the same level. I figured – and it's still – could be the case as teams see him two, three, four times. They start getting on that fastball up in the zone. Still yeah. possible, but he was outstanding. Sonny Gray, I knew was going to be good. I think he's he's underrated from a league wide perspective. I loved that trade for Sonny Gray. When he's healthy, he's been awesome for them. Yeah. So at the top in the front, not not a huge surprise that Ryan and Gray have pitched well when they've been healthy and on the mound. Maybe in the back end a little bit with Bundy early. Josh Winder was very good. I'm not surprised. I knew that this was this is a possible outcome because the Twins, they have these young pitchers coming up in Winder, and you see Yuan Duran in the back of the bullpen. They got more guys coming, which is exciting. And even yeah. beyond, you know, Balzavic, who hasn't been very good at AAA, even beyond him, you know, David Fest is pumping 99 100 at high A, got moved up. They have multiple guys. Louis Varlin, the minor league pitcher of the year last year from Concordia. He's from St. Paul. Very, very good. So they have other guys coming. I'm not surprised in that sense. Maybe I'm surprised at. The way that they did it after the four and eight start where they just rolled and everybody pitched well, including Chris Paddock, who's out now. But it felt like every single day their starters were giving them a chance to win when so many times last year, guys, they would get to the bottom of the first at Target Field and they're down five nothing. And you're trying to put (laughs) you're trying to put together good at bats as an offense. And it's like we have no shot tonight. You know, there's just no way this is going to happen. You need starting pitching that gives you a chance to win. We hear it all the time. That's been the biggest difference as well. They're, they've been given chances to win these games, and they're 32 and 24. They've taken a lot of those chances. Yeah, I got to tell you, Nash, one of my favorite things to do after nearly every Twins game is go check out the box score and pull up Luis Arise's stats for the <laughs> night because more times than not, I can just That's sit there guy. and I just – I just it just brings a smile to my face. Four for four with a walk yesterday. And if it's not that, it's three for five, two for four with two walks. I mean, the twins have one of the hottest, if not the hottest hitter in the league right now. Who's been more impressive for you through this first third of the season? Him or Johan Duran? Like who's more fun and entertaining to just sit back as a baseball lover and watch right now for your money? It's a really good question. Louie in 2019, I remember when he came up and he came up and just hit and he's never stopped. It's <laughs> It's been so fun to watch. And I think when Louis had his stretches last year, there were times when he wasn't very good at the plate. I think it's health related. A lot of the time he's really healthy right now. He's feeling good. Knock on wood. When he's healthy, this is what he does. This is just Louis Arise. He's done it since May of 2019. He did it in the minors. He was as a prospect underappreciated because he didn't have the power but you mm-hmm. see the value that he brings it's it's such an extreme special skill set and it's so unique he's a unicorn he can get to fastballs <laughs> in on his hands he'll spray the ball all over the field he can hit everything he gets to two strikes it doesn't matter you guys know you watch him it's 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 really fun to watch yeah Wanderon gives me the chills when I watch him pitch and mm-hmm. I this is somebody I've written about a lot in the minors and in 2019 he just didn't have the strikeout numbers in the minors and it was it was shocking it's like why isn't he getting swings and misses in the minors mm-hmm. and he had like a 350 all right it wasn't bad it wasn't a bad season but it was surprising he wasn't getting those swings and misses last year he gets moved up to the saints he strikes out 14 of the first 28 hitters he sees and then he got hurt and he struggled and he got shut down with an elbow problem 16 innings i wrote an article in spring training during spring training i said you got to put this guy in the pen this year and you got to let him just eat. And what they did is in spring training, they moved him to the bullpen. Not obviously not because of my Twins Daily article, but they moved him to the bullpen. I thought it was a great idea. They did that and they watched what he did in spring training. It's like this guy's got to be on the team. The biggest thing for him, too, the walks, he's got like a 4% walk rate and a 40% strikeout rate. Usually, guys who throw 100, 101, 102, they have like a 10%, 15% walk rate. Wow. That's that's huge to have a 4% walk rate as a rookie pitching in the biggest Ooh. spots. And how about his composure, guys? You watch him. Mm-hmm. He's so dialed in. He doesn't seem like he's overwhelmed by anything. Jorge Alcala came up, and I love Alcala's arm, and he'll be back soon. And he he's not on the same level of stuff, but he's similar. He's probably got the best, second best stuff in, in the entire organization. He doesn't have that same composure, and it's taken him a lot of time and, and energy, I think, to learn how to deal with those spots and learn how to deal with tight situations. And you can see his energy on the mound. It's sometimes a good thing for him. Other times it's not. 
Duran's like this. And that's what you've seen for the young pitchers. Joe Ryan's the same way. Josh Winder looked to be the same. Bailey Ober, the same way. That's impressive when you see these young guys. But Luis Arise every single day. I think second to Byron Buxton, you feel his absence the most when he's not in the lineup. Yep. Byron Buxton, obviously, you feel it because what he does on both sides of the ball. Luis Arise, such a spark plug for them. I said last night, I think he should be leading off every day and, and hit Buck second. And I think that's probably what they'll do. Still possible they just leave Buck in the leadoff spot. But Louis, he's on one of those stretches. And last year, he he did get a little streaky. So I wonder, this year, is he going to be more consistent? He's not going to hit 350 all year. But I, I'm, I'm very curious to see how he continues to progress into the all-star break. And I think he's their clear-cut all-star right now, him and Duran. Absolutely. And, and so, in that same regard, you, you talked up Duran so much. How about the Tyler Duffy experience? Experience like it's been a roller coaster, and fans are just like at their wits' end with the guy. What's your thoughts on Tyler Duffy? It's tough. I've defended him at times. I've criticized him at times. You look at Tyler Duffy, and when he came and moved to the bullpen in 2019, they moved him down. They they sent him down. He comes back up, and from that point forward, it was like mid May 2019, three years ago. He was one of the best relievers in baseball until the end of 2020. Legitimately, you look at the numbers, you, you watched him, 95-96 was just the hammer, hammer knuckle curve. He was super tough, and he was their fireman. He was coming into all these tough spots, bases loaded, jams. They would go to Tyler Duffy, and he would get outs for them. He mm -hmm. was one of the best relievers in baseball, 2019-2020 combined. Zero question about it. Shortened season was great again. Last year, into mid-May, had like a five-something ERA, and then from mid-May to the end of the season, put up the same numbers as he did in 19 and 20. The difference, his fastball was down to 91, 92. Everyone's like, what's going on? And it shows you the importance of fastball velocity. If you go from 95 to even 93, the difference is massive because then hitters, they're not scared of your fastball anymore. They just sit on that curveball. And you see it with Tyler Duffy. Do you see swings and misses on his curveball anymore? Not really. He's got to spot it up perfectly because they're not scared of getting beat by his fastball when they were two years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's probably time for Tyler Duffy. I, I think that that's become evident. I mm -hmm. think they're going to move him down to like the lowest of lowest roles because his peripherals showed last year. He's a free agent after this year anyway, so he's not going to be pitching for the Twins if it's even now beyond this year, his peripheral show, he's not getting the swings and misses. The fastball velo is down. There are better options back there, younger options back there. And yeah, his time's coming to a close with the twins. And that was almost a disastrous, disastrous loss yesterday. I was, I know twins fans are sitting there just wondering what would have happened if they, if they had blown that game, he was, he was not good. And he hasn't been good for, um, you know, many outings this year when they need him to be. Yeah, stop putting him in high leverage situations like time and time again. It's like Rocco's just like, no, but we believe in Duff. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I will say, Reggie, they, they, you know, to back Rocco a little bit, they lack arms. They need arms. Yeah. And I've heard you guys talk about it before, you know, going out to get a starting pitcher at the deadline. I don't think the Twins have like an, a clear weakness. I think they could get better in all three areas. I think they could add a bat for sure. I think they could add a starting pitcher. They should add a starting pitcher for sure. I think they need bullpen arms absolutely to go into the playoffs. They could add in all areas. And the bullpen, they have how many good relievers right now? One? Yeah. <laughs> they, have, they have one good reliever, like who you're actually very comfortable with putting in the game late in situations. One guy. And maybe Alcala is who he was in the final month and a half of last year, which is dominant. He was so fun to watch last year down the stretch. So maybe he comes back and he gets back to that form. Emilio Pagan is okay, I think. He's yeah. okay. He's not good. He's not awful. You know, when he's pitching well, he's okay. But he's not somebody in a playoff series you're putting out there in the ninth inning. I would, I would not uh, support that decision either. Nash, we could sit here and pick your brain literally all day. <laughs> I know we got to get you out of here. One more. I'm a big draft guy, NFL draft. I know the MLB draft's coming up here soon. But just for a surface fan like myself, who's a prospect or two? Just a name I can jot down to remember that, you know, you think could be kind of exciting for Twins fans to remember in the back of their head over the next two, three years. In the Twin system? Yeah, in the twin system. Oh, yep, man. Twins oh, yep. This is like, I, 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 this is my bread and butter. This is your stuff. I okay. love this. I love <laughs> this. I would say, like, longer term, Emmanuel Rodriguez is, a, is such an obvious choice. He's an outfielder. He plays center. 
probably going to be able to stick in center, but he's 19 years old. Mm. The power has been ridiculous. He was signed by the Twins in 2019 as an international free agent. Mm. I want to say he was a top 10-ish prospect signed in that class. Wow. Good outfielder, left-handed swing, massive power, draws a ton of walks. And the biggest thing is his age. He's 19 years old, and wow. you can see what he's doing right now for Fort Myers. It's It's been yeah. incredible to watch. He's He's unbelievable, and he hit another homer yesterday. I think he's mm. like hitting 280, but his on-base percentage is 480, and he's slugging Ooh. 600 or something nutty. So he's long-term. I think will be their number one prospect in the future. The The strength of this twin system, as much as we loved watching Royce Lewis, and I think Royce Lewis will be a good major league player, that was, that was pretty clear mm -hmm. when he came up. And Austin Martin, I think, even with the way he's played at AA, which is it's been underwhelming, I still think he'll be a good major league player. He has the tools and the hit tool to be a good major league player. So it's the top is fine, but the depth of the system is what separates them. Mm. They have guys like Jermaine Palacios you see come up. A lot of people have never heard of Jermaine Palacios. Mm. Maybe the 20, 25th best prospect in the system, mm. if you consider him a prospect. And he comes up, plays a great shortstop, has a couple of nice hits, put together good at-bats, and you know looked fine as a, a major league shortstop. He's not someone you want playing every day, obviously, but he's fine as a third or fourth string shortstop. So I would say Rodriguez... And then you look at the depth, more arms coming. Marco Raya, they drafted in 2020. Big time arm. He's small. His favorite pitcher is Marcus Stroman. I talked to Marco right after the draft, and he said, people are going to know my name. So mm. Marco Raya, and he's really putting it together this year in Fort Myers and pitching extremely well. I think he'll be up soon. Mid-90s fastball, hard hammer slider, right-handed pitcher, driven, kind of a bulldog on the mound. So I really like him too. Rodriguez, Raya. Uh, I'm gonna give you a third. Let me give you a third. Uh, He's just flexing on us right now. No, we got the Mel Kiper. We got Mel Kiper Jr. on right now, talking <laughs> MLB draft right now. This is unbelievable. Someone a little closer, guys, that I mentioned is Louis Varland. I think he's gone under the radar this year. Matt Cantorino, of course, you guys have probably heard about yes. too. Yep. He, you'll probably see him next as far as arms go, especially if Balzava continues to to struggle at AAA. Cantorino. I've talked to Matt. I talked to Matt this offseason. The stuff is unbelievable. It's it's not Yohan Duran, but it's you know it's the same vein. You know, he's upper nineties with the fastball. If you move him to the bullpen, he's gonna he'll touch triple digits. He, his curveball is twelve six straight down, and his splitter he's added now against lefties is is nasty. Cantorino is going to be someone you will likely see in the second half. I think they they'll watch him. They see what he's doing in the minors unbelievable video game like numbers and they'll say this guy can help us in the bullpen right now so i think you'll see him but louis varland from st paul we always follow the minnesota guys matt walner yeah. louis varland it's fun to watch them and see what they do louis varland huge huge ride on his fastball you think of joe ryan's ramp louis mm -hmm. varland's very similar he's got mm -hmm. a great slider a lot of guys with good fastballs good sliders guys right-handed pitchers in this system louis varland is another one from st paul from concordia i went to concordia uh, I think a 15th round pick a couple of years ago, but now he's wow. one of the best pitchers in the system and he's at double A. So they got guys coming. We're going to continue to see infusion at the major league level. And it's, it's exciting. That's the most exciting thing in baseball as a prospect. It's the most exciting thing to dream on. And then you see how they progress like Jose Miranda or Celestino. Celestino looked like he didn't belong in the majors last year when they called him out. He was terrible. And now he looks like a great, you know, fourth outfielder, maybe even starting caliber. So it's fun to watch. I love it. I love watching these guys progress. I love watching the minors and, and seeing what they do every day. And it's a blast, and we're going to see more of them. Yeah, as an NFL draft lover, I get it. Just the potential of what these guys could become is always fun. Plenty of great names for fans to jot down there. Amazing stuff, Nash. We'll see if the Twins can keep the good juices flowing. Their most daunting test of the year, real litmus test now to see where this team's at because the New York Yankees are coming to town. Hottest team in baseball, first pitch, 6.40 p.m., Rest assured, Reggie and I will be back here tomorrow to break it all down. Rest assured, our guy Nash Walker will be live on Locked On Twins podcast after the game. Check him and Brandon Warren out every game after on Locked On Minnesota Network. And don't forget to follow him on Twitter at NashWalker9. You guys do such great work, man. Love tuning in every game. Keep it up. We'll have to get you on again real soon, all right? Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Continue doing what you're doing. And... You know, continue to toss around some names the Twins could trade for at the deadline. Go, go, go dig it. I, I heard the Juan Soto <laughs> episode. I was like, I like that. Go <laughs> dig in. Circle like five starters and and say, hey, let's let's people love it. So continue doing what you're doing. You the man, Nash. We'll Thanks talk to you soon. Nash. All, right. all right, talk soon. All right, later. 
Nash Walker, again, on Twitter, at Nash Walker 9. Again, check him and Warren Swin podcast out every game, part of the Lockdown Minnesota Network. Reggie, a lot of great stuff from Nash per usual. What's the one thing that just stuck out to you? Dude, his supreme knowledge of the prospects, man. Okay. Like, I got excited. I'm like, can these guys come up now? We're talking to Todd McShay, man. I don't know. I said Nash Walker on the screen, but that was Todd McShay. All right. Time has come. I'm putting Reggie on the hot seat with what does it mean covering all the latest hot topics in Minnesota sports. First up, Vikings signed former third-round pick Jonathan Buller, defensive lineman over the weekend, to help replace Kenny Willekes, who hit the IR for the second time in three seasons. Meanwhile, reports are that tight end Johnny Munt will be fully healthy coming training camp as he returns from a knee injury. Got me thinking, what does it mean when looking at the Vikings' most concerning positions of depth? Not the starters, but depth. What position group scares you, Reggie, the most if the Vikings' top starter were to go down at some point during the season? Oh, it's definitely tight end. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it. I mean, like, they're expecting big things from Irv Smith Jr. this year. But, like, if he goes down, you know, you're relying on Johnny Munt, who is mm -hmm. coming off of a knee injury and mostly kind of known as, like, a blocking tight end. At best, it's just like, man, like, I. And then you're, you're looking at maybe, you know, this rookie or, or some of the, you know, uh, Ben Hughes, Ellison. Seventh round pick. I mean, yeah, I like, think we're getting into C.J. Ham territory at that point. You're going to have to get creative. See, but they need C.J. to you're be, right. you know, that, that fullback mm -hmm. and that lead blocker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what's interesting is, is like, you know, if O'Connell is kind of running McVay's style of offense, then maybe they don't use right. C.J. Ham as a fullback as much because McVay really didn't do a whole lot of that either. But you look at that tight end position because you look at depth on the line. Like, they got plenty of depth, you know, on the defensive line. You know, uh, linebacker. You know, if, if Eric Kendricks goes down at some point, that's concerning as well. I mean, you would like to think Jordan Hicks would just kind of step in and and do the job dutifully, but, like, Eric Kendricks is special, man. Mm -hmm. Like, you predicted that he could lead the team in interceptions last week. Like, you got a linebacker that you're, that you're saying that about? Like, that goes to show how special he is. And so if something like that were to happen, that would be a big blow as well. But look at what they've done over the draft and in the offseason as far as depth – with the DBs where you're talking about, you know, if one of those guys goes down, then, you know, you can just kind of interchange some of those guys, like to the point where you have so much talent back there, where you're talking about employing maybe a three safety look mm -hmm. with trying to get Bynum seen and Smith back there. And so I think it's, it's great to see that they have a lot of good depth on, on wide receiver, you know, you d you don't want to see anything happen to Kirk Cousins because obviously the depth behind him, you know, we saw what what happened in that Green Bay game with Sean Mannion last year. But I think if, if all things are equal and everybody else is healthy and you had to pick one position that really kind of gets you a little bit nervous, I think it would be the tight end position for sure. All right, hear me out. C.J. Ham moves to tight end. Alexander Madison and Dalvin Cook in the same backfield at the same time. Can you see it? Are you digging? Well, run a little uh, spider two wide banana, little John Gruden oh fullback my gosh. special. Come you on, know, man. You know, I wouldn't be mad at that, but you know, you look it's at a, okay, well, look, it's it's a fun thought. Yeah, yeah, but you look at C.J. Ham as a tight end, like the dude is 5'11". It, it, it ain't happening, Reggie. When, when he gets up against Nick and Joey Bosa on yeah, the edge, man, it's, he's not it's chipping. Just, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you're running out, you know, uh, up the seam and across the middle and all that. At 5'11", <laughs> as a tight end, I don't know about that. It nah, ain't happening. All right, crush my dreams. All right, it's, a, it's only Monday, <laughs> but all right. All right, last one up. What does it mean the Boston Celtics got slapped back to reality last Last night after a 29 point loss to the Warriors tying things up one game apiece as we head back to Boston for games three and four two games under our belt what does it mean when trying to predict the winner here of the 2022 NBA finals is all the momentum now back with the Warriors once again was that game one just a fluke we talked about is there any gas left in that tank for the Boston Celtics and their road to get here to the finals and then still game one you know like I said 
this could go a couple ways. You know, they they won that game one Mm -hmm. and really showed out in that fourth quarter, but then came out and got blown out in that that game two. And, you know, we talked about the parallels between that 2012 finals and this one where they came out with the Thunder did and they beat the Heat and then they didn't win another game in that series. And this could play out that same way. It could. I'm looking at this box score from yesterday, okay? And the Warriors had four out of their five starters in double figures. Of course, Draymond only had nine. But you look at this box score with the Celtics. Tatum had 28, okay? Minus 36. I've never even heard of that. Yeah, it's like one of the worst ever. And then you look at Horford, Williams, Smart. All three guys that were, well, not so much Williams, but Horford and Smart in particular, who came up big in game one, two points apiece. Two points apiece. Not going to work. Jalen Brown started the game in fuego, and then he cooled off as it went along. Like, you're just like, well, okay. And And then, you know, you got White coming off the bench. He only scored 12. And so... That is a little concerning when you're talking about Golden State because they had one of those Golden State thirds, 35-14 in the third. They went on that run, and they never looked back. But what I will say is I think I saw enough from the Celtics in the first half that leads me to believe this series is going to be a long one because – They have kind of shown that when the Warriors hit them with their best punch, they can still punch back. Now, that third quarter was just insurmountable for them to to overcome, all right? But this team is full of gamers, man, and I just don't put it past veteran guys like Horford. And then you look at guys like Brown and Tatum who just kind of – they kind of have no conscience out there. And they just go out there and they they play their – very talented guys. And so I wouldn't put it past them. But if you're going to have like Jordan Poole heating up like he did, the, those two shots at the end of the third quarter, it's just like good night, man. Like if he's going to be, you know, splashing it at the pool party, then this thing is is going to be over quick. But it's just so interesting because you're just like the performances that you've seen, are they consistent enough mm-hmm. to last over the course of this series? Because like, if, if Boston kept shooting it at the clip that they did in game one, then they probably beat the Warriors by 10 or 12 last night. And then if the Warriors continue to shoot like they did yesterday and, and the Celtics have the type of shooting performance that they did yesterday, then you're like, okay, Warriors in five. But I don't think that I've seen enough on one side or the other to really make a decision on how – how like short this series is going to be i think it's going to be a longer series and i think it's going to be very telling what happens in game three on wednesday yeah i think no doubt if you're a celtics fan huge we still won game one we yep. we, we head back to boston at, at, at with a split that's a huge win for sure nobody even expected that but i just think a lot of experts are still just looking at both these teams up and down and saying i think if we play seven games here right and we just stretch this thing out more times than not the warriors should win this series just because simply they have more talent top to bottom when they're on mm-hmm. uh and again the road to get here for the the Celtics was just so daunting and so grueling. I'll tell you what, if they do win this thing, that'll be God one bless of the them. most impressive yeah. roads to the finals and championship victories that I personally have seen in probably a decade or longer. Pretty crazy when you think about what they had to do to get here. It's just absolutely wild. I will uh, say this yeah, too, Luke. Yeah. So the grit came back. I remember talking to one of my Ooh. guys and we were kind of just talking about how game one ended up. And we were just like, where's the Warriors' toughness? Mm-hmm. You know, they got back to that. It starts Dray- with Draymond. Draymond came out and he had a point to make. And they feed off that. Mm-hmm. It seems like Draymond just kind of trolls and just kind of plays the villain just to play the villain. But he plays it so well. And the Celtics were like, no, that's not getting in our heads. You know, Draymond is just doing what he does. And it's just like, okay, maybe it's not getting in your heads, but it is getting in his own teammates' heads. And that 
that does a lot for the Warriors because in that game one, I was just like, man, these dudes are playing a little too finesse. Like, they don't have a dude that can, you know, ever since they lost Kevin Durant, you know, a lot of people were like, they didn't even need Kevin Durant. Like, Kevin Durant could go get you a bucket. When the chips were down, when the game slowed down, you can give Kevin Durant the ball and ISO it. And he was going to go get you a bucket regardless of the situation of the game. That was a luxury. What you didn't have anymore, looking at that game one, you were just like, man, like with how Boston just kind of poured it on in that fourth quarter in game one, they didn't have a guy that can just be like, hold on, give me the ball. Let me let me just go ahead and just kind of stave Boston off a little bit. Let me go down here and get two or three straight buckets and just let them know that like we're here. We're 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 gonna fight you. They don't have that. Like their hope is to like, you know, do all this ball movement, give it to Steph, hope he hits a three, you know, give it to Clay, hope he hits a three, give it to Poole, hope he hits a three, like all these finesse guys, you were just like, what about the guys that can just go in there, bang inside, get you a bucket and one, get to the foul line? They didn't have that. You didn't see that in game one. And so now, you know, they play Warriors basketball and found a way to win game two in the way that they do. But they also got a lot of that edge from Draymond because they need that because they are much more of a finesse team than just like, you know, if you give Tatum the ball and put him in an ISO situation, he's going to go and get you a bucket. You saw that earlier in Mm -hmm. the game and in the third quarter a little bit. But, like, the Warriors don't have that guy, so they have to continue to play their style of basketball. And their style of basketball is Draymond Green getting in people's faces, trolling guys, and just being that crazy dude out there. Yeah, you hate to go against him, but, man, he is a lot of fun. You love when he's on your own team. Going to be a lot of fun. Well said, by the way. Going to be a lot of fun to see how all this plays out in Game 3 back in Boston on Wednesday, 8 o'clock ABC. He survived the gauntlet once again. Back here tomorrow, breaking down more Twins, Vikings, NBA, and NHL playoffs, and plenty more. Remember to like, rate, review, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Join us every day for another episode covering all the biggest topics in Minnesota sports. He's Reggie Wilson. Follow him on Twitter at ReggieWilsonTV and on CARE11. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter at Luke underscore Spinman. Tune in tomorrow to Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota. For Reggie, I'm Luke. Until tomorrow, signing out. Be blessed. Spread love this week. This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota.